Yes, speaker. Um, Katarina Perez uh, from the Florida Panthers. Good evening to you, ma'am. Okay. This oh, is man, that makes me feel old. What's that? <laughs> Oh, man, that makes me feel old. All right. Oh, I hate it when people call me sir, too. Okay. As long as they don't call me dad, I'm okay. Um, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Katerina. Um, she has a, a great talk lined up. She added, threw in a, a, an added surprise earlier this afternoon, what she's going to talk about. So uh, it's all yours. And I'm going to play around on the screen here to make sure that you get front and center. Welcome okay. again, Katerina. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing good this evening. Um, I currently am the Vice President of Corporate Partnerships for the Florida Panthers. Um, this is my first season with the Panthers and the first season on the actual team side. So talk about a wild ride for uh, a first season. Um, and before that, I spent many sports radio, 560 WQAM and 790 The Ticket, which I'm sure you guys are uh, really market. Um, before I jump in, I, you know, I want to jump into my background. I want to say, like, it, thank you for being on this because I know at, in this current environment, it's such a strange world to be in. Some of you are parents, you have kids, you have your working jobs, juggling for uncertainty. And, you know, I, I'd say juggling the work at home environment or partially at home environment we're all in right now is is a challenge so you know it's we're all doing the best we can and you're not alone so thanks very much for joining us um i know on my end i'm a in addition to my job i'm a mother of three so between juggling fourth grade eighth grade and ninth grade i realize my strengths and my weaknesses and teaching is not one of my strengths um really, really quickly um, and then juggling a really fast-paced job through through all of this as well so i, I know everyone the other side of this has some some type of challenge that they're working through. So you know, again, we're all we're all doing our best. Um, today, I was just going to tell you a little bit about my journey to FAU, uh, how I got to where I was. But before I kind of go on the maybe the boring story of my story, um, I'm sure you're probably all wondering what the heck is going on in hockey. So. Um, depending on, uh, you know, what sites you follow, as of month, this week we started voluntary uh, training camp where all the players came back a few weeks ago. They were quarantined. During the process, they were all allowed to go back to, to their homes. So whether it be Europe, Canada, you know, San, San Francisco, where it was, all the players went back home. So slow process getting them all back. And then on Monday, we officially began training camp. Um, they can participate in full team activities, but we're going in with a very uh, first regular testing, um, you know, complete precautionary take, uh, being taken. Um, and then on, on the 26th, the end of the month, they start to travel to the hub cities. So we just recently, and, and a lot of these things, you know, I think parts are, you know, really moving at the, you know, flying at the seat of their pants with making some of these decisions. We just found out before it went public that we were going to Edmonton and Toronto as our hub city. So they opted Canadian cities. Um, they, their 12 teams will be in the playoffs and 12 teams will play in qualifying rounds. We are one of them. What the NHL did was try to replicate to the almost exact statistical number the chance that a hub team would have had to get to the playoffs. So I think it was something like 12.2 to 12.7 percent 12 teams had of getting in. So they tried to replicate an environment that almost exactly mirrored that. Um, and that has 12 teams in, 12 teams on the bubble, and we play a best of three series again the New York Islanders. We're officially in the playoffs. Um, so we'll be playing in the, we'll, the Stanley Cup will be going on right through August, mid-September. Um, with that, we we'll probably put the draft end September-ish and then a state maybe, you know, Thanksgiving, early January, sort of depending on, uh, I, I feel like, you know, COVID things are almost changing, you know, every single week. So 
our intent is to start next season full fans. We've got a couple sports ahead of us that are um, sort of, you know, feeling it out, namely NFL. Um, so we'll see our regular season next season kind of kick in probably uh, December, possibly January. So that's a little bit of an update on, um, on where we are later in this. I was going to share a um, business pitch that we did for Prop 12, which is Conor McGregor's Whiskey. Um, also a kind of a start finish creative of how we're making our during this. Because obviously a big question we're getting is you didn't finish the season, we paid all this money, no one's in the stands, how are you making it right for us? Um, every team is having these conversations. I was just going to share with you a little bit of what we did with Lexus to create a behind the scenes called Panthers Uncaged. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, you know, I've, I've always known I wanted to be in sports and entertainment, and um, I, I grew up in Canada, so I guess by default I have to be a hockey fan. Um, family down here when I was 15, and I went to school in Coral Springs, and I chose at the end because I, I, I opted to stay home because I wanted to have um, a ton of options to take on internships. Um, I, you know, I, I really am such a huge believer that this business, whether it's sports or it's media, you know, it's, it's, it's who you know, it's the experience you have, it's the work you're building, it's, they'll, they'll take jobs and internships that you don't like, and that's fine. You'll find out what you like, you'll find out what you don't like. Um, and to me, you know, I just wanted to experience so many different parts of what the sports world was, was like. I almost considered myself like an extension of the team. I was never going to be the guy. But I heard, you know, for us, when you suit up on game day, some people suit up with a helmet, some people suit up with a suit, and that's your game day. And I always, I always felt that. So going to FAU, I was a communications major, um, business minor. I also took this fantastic class on, it was a geography cat credit, random fun facts. It was very fun. <laughs> um, and being there let me have the opportunity to intern um, at 60 WQAM and then also intern with the East Coast Hockey League because here they had the Miami Matadors for one season. So it was a, it was a pretty short season, but, um, but it it was a very lean organization that gave me the ability to, to do a lot. Um, so after I left FA, FA, hooked and I knew I wanted to be in sports in some capacity. Um, and I say in some capacity because I think sometimes, sometimes people get really kind of laser focused on, you know, I work in baseball at a team or I need to work with this organization. Um, but you can want to work in that field and learn those skills and, and have those experiences, but work under different other places than a team. You know, it, it could be a video game company. It could be a TV station. It could be a radio station. It could be a social media company. And, and your sports management of skills and experiences can, can equally be um, delivered there. Um, you know, I, so like, don't get hung up on that one perfect job. Like, there's 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 so many out there that that will give you kind of what you're looking for professionally. Um, you know, when I interned at their station, it was your typical internship. I I, it, I, I filled out promotion forms and ran errands, and, you know. But then I also got to like meet meet guys like Joe Rose, who, full circle, 20 years later. I was I was working with and taking out on sales calls and selling endorsements with and, and working with him side by side, you know, just random. Um, at my graduation at FAU, they announced the, the new football team. So that puts into perspective when I graduated. Um, it's really nice to see how different the campus is now and how much it's grown. Um, I've been back a lot for games, concerts and stuff like that. Um, when I graduated, I went to work for uh, CBS Sportsline, and that wasn't my greatest of jobs. I was straight up in the newsroom. I worked from 7 at night till 2 o'clock in the morning every day, and it was just, 
following AP and Reuters feeds, getting them out, headlines. Um, it, was, it was very, very much like a news focused um, job, very journalism focused. Uh, a great job for someone who that's their, their focus and what they want to do. Again, it wasn't my greatest job, but it helped me hone in the things you like, the things you don't. And it also really helps you grow. Every position helps you grow your network. Um, and again, you know, I can't stress every single person you meet, stay in touch with. It is such a small world and it is it's such a huge career universe out there that the people you work with will come full circle and you will end up meeting them and being in their circles professionally again at some point in time. Um, after that, I got my first position in radio and I worked quickly through the ranks with iHeart Media. Um, I was a salesperson at the time selling WIOD in Miami, which had the station of the heat. So in addition to selling news talk, um, we got to sell the amazing LeBron run uh, in, 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 or at the I mean, run in Miami, and uh, creatively coming up with ways to sell pre-game naming runs and in-game spots, post-game shows, um, I was really a salesperson, but very quickly wanted to move into management. I walked into my general manager's office. This is, this is my boss's boss's boss. So I emailed him, knowing he was pressed for time, and I said, I need 10 minutes of your time, Mr. Tulis. And I walked into the office, and I said, one day I want to be sitting in your seat. Do what I need to do. And I always remember that because sometimes people just, they're afraid to maybe reach out like that. They don't want to seem arrogant, hey, I want your job one day. But I, you'd be really surprised at how people appreciate that and they're willing to tell you so much. Um, what he told me that day was to always be judged for what you can do based on what you're doing now. Be the very, very best person you are now and your next opportunity will come and so that's what I did I, I put my hand in everything I volunteered on every initiative I worked really hard and pretty quickly my first um, management position came up and it was not glamorous by any means so I got to go from the brand new Miami iHeart building brand new decorated redone renovated like the model of the company to being sales manager of stations in Port St. Lucie. So I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Port St. Lucie, but it was, I mean, they warned me before I started that sometimes the toilets don't work here and they backflow and, you know, we're just giving you a warning, this is not Miami. And so I never made a decision about a position for money. Um, I always made it based on the opportunity. And one of my good mentors said, said, find something broken and fix it. Like, you don't want to go to that best, great, awesome team that's hit its peak. Go to the team that's challenged, struggling, and you can make your mark. And so when I went in there, I saw a diamond in the rough, and I said, this, this, is, this is my job. I will drive an hour and a half to Port St. Lucie from, from Coral Springs every day. An hour and a half there, an hour and a half back. And I did that every day for like two and a half years. Um, my performance there got me promoted to Melbourne, Florida, where in Melbourne I became, I was 32 at the time, and I became one of the youngest market presidents for iHeartRadio. But again, they said, look, the market's failing, it's not doing good, you have a lot of work. It's perfect. I'm all about it. Um, so I made my removal. Not everybody had opportunity and luxury. Um, yeah, I was did that with three kids, which is which is crazy. When they were little, it was it was a little easier to move when they were littler than now that they're, that they're bigger. Um, but in all the markets that I was in, I got to work in sports again, not at a team level, from grassroots level. So Melbourne, Florida, no professional teams. Um, Washington Nationals, minor league baseball, um, and training camp in minor league baseball. When training camp would come through, I just made it my mission. You know. I'm going to meet every decision maker there. I'm going to go out of my way to come up with ideas. We would have the players introduce the song every, every like every for the whole week they were in town, like five, six o'clock, seven o'clock, they would introduce the song. 
we would get our jobs go out there and do bits and throw balls and get content and put it on our website. Um, just really kind of creating a cool fan experience. Um, and again, getting to know people and keeping their contacts, following up with them. Um, sometimes I think people get annoyed to follow up with people regularly. It's not. It's not. Um, it'll be the secret to your success when you meet someone, follow up with them. Something nobody does anymore and send a note and a business card to follow up with them on certain, you know, hey, I hope your opening day went well. Hope, you know, following up with people through like the, the spikes of their relative business. Um, after that, I was offered a position in Norfolk, Virginia. So we picked up and moved again. Um, I think. If there was frequent flyer miles, like with moving companies, I could probably catch a few in. So we went up to Norfolk where, again, there's no professional teams in Norfolk, Virginia, but there's a minor league baseball team. There's a minor league hockey team. Um, small world, my now boss, played on that minor league hockey team. And we did a ton with college basketball. So we got to take the stations and, again, just come up with really neat ways to integrate with the teams people, connecting with them, staying in touch with them. Um, after that, I was offered a position in Seattle. So I did move around a lot. Encourage people bumping around it. Um, but if you're moving up in your own company, that's always a, a, a good thing. So Seattle was a really big market. It was, it was a really big jump, not just geographically to um, jump across the country, but it was, it was a lot more revenue that I was overseeing. I had seven radio stations. I had 40-something salespeople. Um, there, I got to, so here, Fox 60 and 790, they have all the broadcast rights. Heat, Dolphins, Canes, um, Panthers. The only ones they don't have, they don't have our MLS in Um In Seattle, we had none. We lost everything. We had none. So everything we did was kind of up into that line where we basically had a cease and desist, <laughs> basically. Um, so we had who is just a freaking superhero out there. Um, he was on our morning show. So we would sit with him and find out what his needs, wants, and likes were. You know, loves his grandkids. Okay, wants to, you want to buy a swing set for your grandkids and partner him with a client that would do that for an endorsement. We would create sweet and greets. So we would have clients, you know, spend spend dollars on our stations, and they'd get to come out to the suite with Mike Holmgren, meet him, and enjoy that experience. Um, Robert Turbin, who played for the Seattle Seahawks, he, huge top 40 guy, just loved being out in the boat, was big in the social scene. We would have him come and do um, the Turbin over. And every Thursday, he'd come over and you know, four or five hours of the afternoon show, He'd introduce the songs, he'd talk about what he was doing, and then we would connect him with, you know, like he would do a Metro PCS or a, a T-Mobile event. Um, so kind of connecting the dots that way, creating fun banter, creating content, really taking sort of taking the world of sport and, and connecting it with typical normal sport world, if you, if you say. Um, the thing about each of those roles that, that I loved, again, it was not about the nuance of the team or the job. It was the opportunity personally to see how – what I realized in all of this is every job that I took became much more um, – and I realized I, I work very well in the environment. And, you know, some people do, some people don't. Um, some people – have an environment where they have to make difficult decisions. Some people do. Some people, again, became very self-aware. Um, after that, that time we'd been on the road for about, I guess, about eight years at that point. Um, I was ready to come back to Florida with the family and the kids, and that's where my conversations with 560 and 790 came together. Back to 790, and within a year, 560 and then merged. So I over both stations. And I got to work with the, the sort of the me currently, the Heat, uh, the Dolphins, the Hurricanes, and the Panthers. And that's sort of where the conversation started of, hey, we need someone just like you. And they, they booing me and they acquired me, basically. Um, 
you know, your, your brand is very, very important because what I didn't realize is Matt Caldwell, our CEO, called, you know, he called John Vitalin at the Heat, he called Tom Klein at the Dolphins, he called Charles Nieves at the, 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 the Hurricanes before I even knew it, saying, I reach out to this person. And when the people you work with say really good things about you, he gets the phone, he's like, we need to talk to you, we want you to work for us. Um, I think the Panthers brought me on. Again, you from the background. I'm not your typical team sports, sponsorships, naming rights, logos to nice, help jersey patches. That's not right. I come from. But I think the world of sports sponsorships, like, like TV, like digital, like concerts, like, it's changing, and especially now. It's, it's a company, big brand. I don't want to say branding is, is irrelevant, but no one's going to pay $500,000 for a logo on the ice. What is that doing to help sell a car? What is that doing to help grow my business? How, how is that making me connect better with the community? So I challenge my team all the time when we're talking to our clients is it doesn't matter what we're selling. What are we trying to accomplish? So we're just this vehicle. We're, I like to say we're a launch pad, not a destination. BB&T Center is not the end of all. Panthers are not the end of all. If your goal is to sell your software, connect with big business, help the community, and you know, reward your employees, awesome. That we can help you with that. That's what we can help you with. Um, and every industry has thought about their journey that way. Right? We're not salespeople. We're more storytellers. Like you tell me what you're trying to do. To our story and see if it fits. And if it fits, if it fits, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't, we'll move on. Um, it's, you know, that sort of that return on investment and how how we're just a, a, a vehicle essentially to helping make that. And I think our world is just so different now because that used to be so like approachable and, and now you can see what someone's having for breakfast. You know, now you can see pictures of their kids on vacation. You know, so how do you take that emotion and that connection to emotion and sport and now tie it to brand awareness and then ultimately driving revenue? So from a perspective of why do, what I guess, like the theoretical, what I'm thinking, um, in, in, in specifics, um, I this I leave the sales side and the activation side. So I have four people who are straight business development sellers. Um, they research brands that fit for the sport, fit for the area. You know, for us, we're obviously going to call on a lot more, say, hurricane shutters. Whereas if you're in Detroit, it's probably not relevant. We might have a lot more marine and boat companies where, you know, in Nashville, it's not relevant. And also finding companies that are trying to fit our demo. Hockey is the number one growing sport with millennials, number one growing sport with women. So how do we tell that story to a brand that's trying to make those things happen? Um, I also lead the activation side. So we call it selling the dream and servicing the nightmare. Um, when we sell all of these cool things, if you sell it and then disappear into a crap job at executing, you're never going to renew it. You're going to have a bad reputation in the market. So our, our activation team is everyone that makes sure what we're selling. So you might walk into a game and you see people doing a presentation with giveaways on the tarmac, or a client might have their, you know, their kids writing pony, or really sampling, of, you know, on the on the uh, concourse. We had a company do a flash mob dance once at an intermission, which was hilarious. They're an air conditioning company, but they wanted to do something really fun and out of the world, out of this world, and they. We're, we're all like we're and hot dogs and beer just chilling at first intermission. Like 45 to start going crazy and they start giving out shirts. We're putting all that together at any given point in time. Florida Panthers Foundation, we give out $25,000 every single game to a local um, charity of some sort. And so we're, you know, we're putting that together all the time too of who we're giving it to. The, you know, the, the, making sure they get the kind of the visual at the game to ensure 
giving them the press and promotion and the exposure that they're looking for too. Um, now, I'm sure you're probably saying, like, so what are people saying to you now? Like the biggest, I'll be fully transparent, the biggest question we're getting now, imagine if you're Miller Coors, and going, your building hasn't been open for two weeks, you're not selling any beer, I paid you in advance the first month of our deal, how are you making this good? Or I'm Lexus, I close Lexus in your building where hundreds and hundreds of people are going in and out, seeing my branding. We have the signage on the screen has our logo. We've got logos in your ice. No one's seen any of that. How are you making that good for us? What I was going to do is kind of walk guys through and not to the person. We'll see if this works. With Alexis as an example. No, that's, hold on. Oh, there it is. Access, what we did is we kind of sat down and said, what are you guys really looking to accomplish? And they said, we're challenged because we have no cars on our lot. So when they shut down, all, they shut down all the manufacturing plants, they shut down travel, transit, the auto industry came to a halt. Um, but people were also really concerned about, we don't want to look like we're advertising in a difficult time. We don't want to look like our brand is just splashing out there. We want to keep true to what our brand is, um, but also connect with people and at least have the exposure. So we came up with a concept called Unpaged. And again, we came back to them and said, this is going to help value-wise with the impressions you're going to get, the exposure you're going to get, and I'll walk you through this. This will help right set us, and you'll still see the, get the eyes on you, the impressions, the connection with your brand. You're just going to get it differently. Um, every brand had to pivot during this to how are you going to connect with your consumer completely differently. So we basically keep there's uncaged. Now, we've never done this before. A, behind the scenes view of our team. As soon as we found out we were going to be going to hub cities and playing this, we said, what a better way, like obviously a really premium upscale brand, you know, this is going to be a can't buy access to behind the scenes look. So we said, you guys can see this, right? You don't see no, we, can't. we just have a blank screen, uh, Katarina. Oh, you do? It says you're trying to you're start. It says. Um, yeah, we have, uh, we have something that is like the prelim to when someone shares something. It's a black screen, and then, and then the content will come up. Hold on. Maybe it's like that. But right, right now, we just have a, a black screen. See? I don't know why it's doing that. Aw. We can see, a, a, I think we can see a, a little bit of your cursor on the screen. That's about it. You can see my cursor, but hold on, maybe let me stop this and start it again. Sorry, guys. That's all right. Happens all the time. Are you still connected with us, uh, Katarina? I think we might have lost her because of the ban uh, bandwidth. Is everyone still connected with me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, because I can't see you right now.
I can see her her vi video off screen. Um, there might be some bandwidth bandwidth issues. Video is not current. Video resume automatically when conditions approve. There you are. Oh, you're back. Yeah, for some reason it's not working. I'm sending a video of what the end product was. I wanted to, oh man, sorry about that, guys. I wanted to walk you through sort of the whole process that we had in it. Okay. Oh, can you guys still see it? I'm sorry? Can you only see a dark screen? We can still see a dark screen, and we can see your small cursor moving around a little bit, a very tiny cursor. You're over on the right now. Yeah, over on the left, yeah. You know, unfortunately, this is now not showing, so I apologize. That's um, okay. I did what sort of the sizzle reel is coming out to be. I don't know if you can open it there at all. Um, you sent it to my email or? Yeah. Okay. Let me just, uh, let me see if I can get to that and see if I can bring that up. Hold on one sec. Thank you. Um, I haven't. There you go. Now can you see it? Uh, I'm away from the oh. screen. Yes. Yay. Yes. Woo okay. Yep. We're back. Okay. We're I'm back. back. Okay. Only an hour. Sorry for that. Okay. That's so, all right. <laughs> again, we have to have a moment, right? So we have to come back and say, hey, instead of cutting you back a check for a company, this is our concept to, to make it right for you guys. Uh, overview. We're going to show them custom graphic, what, what the unveil is going to look like. Um, a couple of mock-ups, what the strategy behind the promotion was, uh, create the whole timeline, and the team. And what, what you find in this world is when you, it's not, you know, in a lot of worlds when you're working, say, in finance, right, you're working on the ability to, you're working around a quarter. You can prep for Q1, you can prep for Q2, you can prep for Christmas, you can prep for Halloween. We're working like this and in this environment. Like you're in the playoffs, got to go. I mean, we have clients that are like, I need to call you tomorrow morning. I need to know. So we had to move so fast on this. Um, we kind of overviewed, the, did an overview of the whole concept, and we really wanted to stay heavy, heavy mobile in the graphic imaging and the creative, because again, this was when we were still on straight lockdown. So this was still when everything was closed. Uh, you know what happens when you fuse the Panthers? Start with Lexus sleek bold logo design, you get Panthers uncaged. So we wanted to get their buy-in to what did did they like the feel of this? Did it fit their brand? Did they like it? Um, and what it would potentially look like on a mobile application. This, if we want this maybe just because it's slow I'm sharing it, we wanted to see what the un of the logo will look like. This, the, the screen on the right actually sort of shows just it's a really close-up screen pan of what that logo would look like. To show them some of our digital imaging and what um, the integration to that would look like with you know how you could just get online, how you could jump on the Panthers uh, Instagram, how you could jump on Facebook and would start to see. You, this, Actually, a mobile, because I think maybe just because it's again screen sharing, the whole piece down here, um, that whole middle piece is an active graphic. So it was a storytelling for us as we talk them through it. Um, cage marketing strategy. And we're, we're selling them the vision before we have, we have a pencil here. Hey, this is the pen, and I'm selling it to you. We're, we're selling them the vision of what we were going to create for them before we even did a thing. We were going to have a really great logo reveal with press release, social media, website, media partners. Um, we we're going to uh, do a promote from certain 
advertising on ESPN.com, on Sentinel, YouTube, Panthers pages, and then start into the um, episodes, which first episode launched on last Wednesday. It's re this Saturday on Fox TV, which picks it up, which is massive. You can see it on YouTube. You can see it on NHL.com. And every Wednesday from now on, uh, they're coming out as well. And again, we were telling the story of we're following players through their journey of flying home, of getting tested. Of one of our players' wives is pregnant. He's getting ready to leave next Monday, and he's going to be back by the time she has the baby. So there's a lot of emotion in that we wanted to capture. And again, not having any of that from behind the scenes before we were really excited and passionate about we're going to make this awesome for you. Some graphics, just some of the different size banner ads, some of the different creative that we look at. Timeline of the launch. And we didn't have a formal timeline, but they're making decisions to coordinate with their marketing and their creative team and their advertising. And whoever we're talking to has bosses above them, so we wanted to at least arm them with here's what we're looking at. And then we wanted to tell the story of the team behind it. So much when you're, when you're doing this, it's not just faceless people executing. We want you to know if you've got a problem with something, this is who you can call. Video team, writer, video editor. And through all of this, we, we just stayed very close and connected to Texas in terms of what each person was doing. Thank you. So that was, um, and I want to see, hopefully now I can get this to share. Okay, I have to stop sharing this and share you what this, what the ultimate sizzle reel ended up coming up to be. Times the charm, we can do this. I always click the wrong screen too, so don't worry about it. Always, always. Oh, I want to show you this is it's a short one. I don't know. Okay. You know what? It's not going to pull up. It said it's you can you can jump on YouTube, our our Instagram page. It's it's all over that. Um, but I'm having trouble sharing that one with you, so sorry about that. But they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They, they, they love being a part of the content piece. I mean, right as we're, as as it starts, you're pulling in and you're just seeing this super cool um, Lexus shot of the car driving up. And so it ended up being a really, really nice piece. And it's a content series now for the next six weeks. So check it out. I encourage you to take a look at it. And what you'll notice, you'll notice that little Lexus logo watermarked in the corner. You'll notice some of the players and coaches pulling up in their cars in Lexus vehicles. Um, so we also tried to be very clear with them, like, we don't want this to be cheesy product placement. We're in a difficult time right now. So, you know, players coming home and getting COVID tested is not the time to, you know, use a Lexus logo. Um, so we're really um, understanding with us on that. And after episode one, we can all the digital impressions, social, web, commercials, commercial from uh, Nielsen, and show it to them and say, hey, this is the actual for dollar value this is this is giving you. You guys can see it's all for one now? Yeah, we can see yes. something. For one? Cool. Okay. New business that pitched to Trump, uh, 12, which is uh, Connor McGregor's um, uh, whiskey. So, I don't know how it came about. Sort of obviously, he's a fighter. This sport we don't want to be known as just a fighting sport. But this, there was sort of just this marriage of for us. If you if you he won Stanley Cups with the Boston Bruins. He he knows him knows McGregor. And so there was this this nice energy of sort of what we wanted to pitch for them. And we just pitched this about two weeks ago. So this is this is a conversation we just had. Um, what the objective is, you know, we want to form a partnership. When we say corporate partnership, you know, so many things you sell, you sell something and you, you sell it. Here, I'm giving you this. 
the great thing about the partnership world is we're doing so many cool things to move your product and help your business in our building. And obviously you're gaining from the from from the reciprocal ROI. So for them, they wanted to build brand awareness and um, they had a key marketing team here that they needed to use. So where do we put that marketing team? We're going to put it in VB and D Center and use you guys as a vessel to do so. We'd like to talk about who we are as a team. Our ownership team came in about five years ago. If you spend any time in the Florida market, the, our former leader was, put it in perspective, we had 300 partners. Uh, Vinny Viola, he bought the team. He's a hedge fund guy in New York. He bought the team. He walked around BB&T Arena and he said, this looks like a circus. Take, take, that, take that down. We went from 300 partners to 100 partners. So we like to talk about our leadership that we have, and who they are, and how they're different. We like to talk about our hockey league that um, – Finally, we invested in an awesome uh, multi-Stanley Cup winning coach who came here and said, I'm not coming here to coach a losing team. We're also going to invest in the on-ice product. We made, whether you like hockey or not, we like the plane. We invested in the coach, and we invested in a lot of moves on the ice to win. We like to talk about the T Center being a hockey test. Um, we have a ton of top-level events. We're a part of... Oakview Group, which I'll show you on the slide, but you know everything from you, know, you can see the the liners. You know you, you got Iron Maiden to New Kids on the Block, Zach Brown Band, and everyone in between. And what BB and T Center events do is, you see the map here. The group is a group that negotiates contracts on it's like a 28 arena center. So if you want to play the Chase Center. And you're pink and you want to play there twice, you have to play Miami twice. If this is Oakview, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank yeah. you. If you want to play, you know, Boston Garden twice and you're, uh, you know, Elton John, you have to play BB&T Center twice. So when we negotiate our hockey contracts, we also do a ton of setting of the non-hockey stuff that goes on because you know, there might be 43 home games. We'll have 120 events in that building every single year. So that's really about too and you know we know a lot about the hockey demographic once you're playing in you know every other concert that comes in that demographic and it gives you a whole other person that you're talking to talk about who our hockey demographics are and you know, average age home ownership you know that kind of thing and again this is just one piece of the puzzle because when we're talking about process and events it completely changes talk about our county penetration, about the impressions in the arena. So this is where okay, this slide will is for the, the, the good and the yin and the yang of our presentation because obviously if you're a partner that we're presenting to right now, they're going, hold on, how many people are going to have in there this year? How many people are this year? So now we've consistently grown our attendance. Um, but we are going to be dealing with sort of the, the what does three to six months look like in our building. Uh, arena impressions as they've grown. Uh, demographics. And then we go into our partnership assets. We talk about, this is the, I don't know if you can see my, my uh, thing moving around here, but Jevotron. So basically, they would have the entitlement as the Irish whiskey of the players. They would have the ability to use our logo rights and be the entire logo rights. And where this is important is if you're going to walk into Total Wine, the point of sale marketing, they could actually have a Panthers logo. And it's going to get your attention on an aisle where there's 45 different Irish whiskeys. That's going to help them move product. So it's not just about moving product in our building. It's about how do they use the, our rights and move product in other stores and move it outside of our building. A, a dashboard. Dashboards where they become very, uh, very valuable, especially now. Um, 
is when they're too visible. So never before did we think saying, hey, with no fans, you know, your TV dashboard is going to be like, well, um, but this is where we also support TV ratings. To a, a BB&T, for example, and say, hey, you pay X for your partnership, but you got Y in TV visibility. So if you pay $100,000 for your partnership, you would have had to go and spend $500,000 on Fox TV to get that TV viewage if you were going to buy a commercial. In arena visibility, so there's Club Lexus. Um, someone asks for a whiskey in the arena, that's what they're going to get. If someone's entertaining in a suite, when they place their orders about 48 hours before they're going to come in the suite, um, they're going to see that and have the ability to order it before they get in the suite. The penalty box. So we thought this was just a perfect, and we don't like to glorify the fighting in our sport, but considering um, Conor McGregor, and thought this was a perfect, that now every time someone was in there, they would get, they would see proper 12. This is really big, really big for every sport, cashless uh, POS. So, when you're going to buy something, you're buying hot dogs and the, for you, the kids, you're buying a beer for your buddies, you're buying, that you're not pulling out cash, that you're not connecting with a, 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 a car. You're buying a just point of sale, you're literally kind of pinging it on your phone, which for you is easy, for them is easy, it's clean, it's no touch, it's contactless. However, it's invaluable data that you're gathering through the process. Um, as, as a vendor, you can now, really track and isolate like, who's buying your product. Um, do we sell more beers at country concerts? Do we sell more wine at Pink? Do we, you know, do we sell more hot dogs at the Jurassic Park show? Like those kind of business decisions you can really now see as you're, as you're monitoring sort of where people are buying. You can also see in your arena where the points of purchase tend to be higher. You know, are you buying more when you walk in the door? Are people going in and moving around and buying more? So the data that's going to come out of this out of absolutely every arena is going to be astonishing and really, really, really valuable consumer insights that come out of this. Digital marketing, you know, how do we tie them into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat? We have an entire team that does nothing but say, how do we take our brand and not make it an ad, not make it a commercial, how do we take our brand and how do we take the, the Panthers brand and your brand, connect them and make it really relevant content? I don't know if this is going to play. I'll give it a second. Oh, no, I'm going to play, so I'll just kick to the next. What, you're gonna, what you saw there is sort of a play on, you know, Connor's walk. And basically, we pitched them that we would sign Conor McGregor to a one-day contract, that he would be the player number 12 for a game, and we would have the ability to use him in a jersey. I mean, just the media, social media there alone, um, for us as a brand would be huge, and obviously for Proper 12 would be huge in the market. So that was being the goal celebrations was a big part of, of what we pitched them. We also do our three starts of the game. And again, this is an extension, game's over. How are we still connecting with people? How are we still connecting with people who's on home? Now they are still seeing your brand outside of the building. And the connection with their Panthers Foundation. So this again is something that the Viola family started when they, when they purchased the team. They have four pillars, building the game of hockey, sporting health and education initiatives for children, uh, advocating and supporting veterans' issues and raising awareness for the Florida Panthers. So, you know, how would we take um, their brand and connect it likewise? And another thing we do events as fundraisers for these, and it's it's the CEOs of all our top partners. So, when so much of what we do is connecting people, you know, connecting the CEO of this company to the CEO of that company and letting the magic happen. So, when people come to these events, they get to be front and center with some of the decision makers that can really potentially help grow their business. 
So this would be a huge press release around the signing of number 12, you know, the one day contract with, with Connor. So we would big it up, you know, big press release and, you know, hopefully he would do it on his own too. And then here, just list out the asset summary. So we make it really easy for them. This is all the stuff we're giving you. Um, these are all the things that we're putting in as a conversation piece. And then we kind of give it to them to say, you marinate on this. You tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. Tell us you want to change, tell us you want to keep, and then we'll continue and further to the, the discussion. Um, I think a, a big part that's worth sharing is um, our deals have a long life cycle. So it's not, it's not like you go, you have a conversation, you put the pitch together and you get an answer in the next week. Because of the size of the deals, they're often things that happen. You know, conversation now could be something that closes in November or December. <laughs> And I can share those with you guys too. And then just the last thing I wanted to share is sort of the, the importance of, of your network and, and mentorship. Um, I surrounded myself with mentors and not just in the industries I wanted to be in. Now you'd be amazed, especially during this, this kind of work at home environment, you can find people on, on LinkedIn, message them and just say, hey, I've read your bio, I've read your story, I would love to connect with you and find out more about how you got to where you were. And you'd be amazed at how many people go, sure, I'll give you 15 minutes of your time. And those are invaluable connections. Um, I had the opportunity to speak for, I was on Inspiring Women in Radio, and I would, I would fly myself out on my own dime to go speak to these like, young women who were just moving into leadership positions. Um, I was invited to speak on the Football Unites panel, Dolphins, I said, sure, absolutely. Um, again, just the context you meet are huge. One of my goals during, during all this was, to, to continue networking and growing my network, even though it was stuck in my house. Um, and I would reach out to, to, I'd reach out to two people who would reach out to someone else. So one of them I did with a friend of mine at Amazon and then a friend of mine at the NHL. Then she invited a friend of hers at Jaeger. So it was the Panthers, NHL corporate, Jaegermeister, and Amazon. And we all had a roundtable Zoom discussion an hour on the challenges of working the challenges of leading a team, keeping your team motivated, how you keep yourself motivated. Came out of that with an awesome network. Did another one with Norwegian Cruise Lines, um, who she invited someone from JetBlue, and then I also invited someone from Live Nation. So between the four of us, we talked about our, our businesses have been rocked to a halt. What are we doing now to, to work around that? You know, great network and great, great, uh, great connections. Um, and I would just say make, make doing that, the people you meet, the people you connect with, staying in touch with them regularly, a really you know, top, top part of what you do. Um, and that's really all I got. We, we've been working. So many people think, um, you know, pause, like you have nothing to do. What's, what's great, almost feel like we're, we've been working harder because um, we've been trying to stay relevant even though we're not playing. And now we're two weeks away from hitting the ice and – figuring out who's going to get those TV visible pressures in Toronto, who's going to get the penalty box sponsorship, how are we going to make our other partners good. And so we've been running a million miles a minute doing that. Um, so we've been, we've been really busy for sure too, but you know, it's a really exciting time to be with the Panthers and to be in hockey and, you know, hopefully uh, we have an awesome return to the ice. I'm sure there's going to be questions. Uh, let me start off with one. Um, did you get much pushback? for your uh, plan make goods there on that, on that first piece that you showed us? Or did everyone buy in? Uh, what's interesting is you can have, uh, uh, you can have more back on a $20,000 make good than you do on a $125,000 make good. Let me just do that. <laughs> so, yeah. but you know, I think it's all about buying from the start. Like we didn't together just, our brains. It was what do you guys want? What's important to you? What do you need? Give us, give us some time, and let's put that together. So it was sort of collaborative based on what they needed. But yes, for some people it's easy, and for some, some it's challenging. It is. Okay, and I'm going to ask one more, and then I'm going to turn over to the students. Um, when you were doing this thing with McGregor, um, had he been retired already? Was or was he still with the uh, UFC or? We just pitched that two weeks ago. Okay. All right. So that would have been neat, though, if he was still with UFC, um, and you guys have events there, right? 
you have U- we were UFC events. The yeah. So Sean, Sean Thornton had a really good relationship with um with the UFC and the U- I guess they had a big fall out of Miami and said we're never coming back. And they came back wow. and they're gonna come back again when they come back around. But you know, again, his the extension of his band is is massive. So it's, it's like a good win win for both of us. Okay, great. I'm sure we have lots of questions from the students out there about your career, about uh, you know the uh, uh, corporate partnerships in general, and what you do, the sales piece, uh, the activation pieces. So I'll uh, I'll turn it over to the students. Hey, Katarina, this is Zach. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, I'm in sponsorships with uh, the Kentucky Derby as well, so I'm very interested to hear what you all are doing. Um, can you speak a little bit on? That what the NHL's plan is for sponsorships within the hub cities. I think you touched on that a little bit, deciding how you know, who's going to get what. But what are they giving to the teams um, to use per game, or how is that working? Great question. Um, again, we've been waiting for a long time for the final answer on that. <laughs> so we, we are at an exhibition game. So it's, they're splitting it a third, a third, a third. So uh, New York will get a third, we get a third, and the league gets a third. Um, all in ice logos go to the go to league partners. Um, then once we get into the qualifying rounds, they alternate home game, away game. And what's going to happen? We're going to be playing three games a day. They're going to be rotating dashers out three t- times a day, which is going to be insane. Um, but we basically got access to on our home games 14 dashers, and then uh, and two of the benches, and then on theirs they get it. So we had the ability to. Which, which actually was pretty fair. They obviously took all the nice logos, the, the league gets the rest, and then we had 14 dashers for each of those play, playing games. And then once it goes to playoffs, it, they take they take it off. Playoffs, the NHL owns all of those. And we have the right to sell in um, a few positions, but it's only non-competing sponsors. Hello, Ms. Press, can you hear me? Hi, um, my question is, so has COVID-19 affected either like retention or acquisition of partners during this? Because I can imagine with a lot of big companies that are going bankrupt, I imagine there's a lot of also, also smaller local companies that end up going bankrupt as well. So has it been, has there been any pressure on you as far as like trying to retain these partners through this time? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so I'd say the, the benefit of the partnership world is multi-year agreement. Um, and we, we're we really lucky as a team. Um, so a, a long answer to that, Vinny, he was the, one of the number one donors to Irma Relief. He was an anonymously the number one donor to Marjorie Stone Douglas. Um, during all of this, he said, we will not be furloughing or laying off any of our staff. The people who need me now is our staff. So we're very lucky for that because there's dozens of teams that were 50, 60, 70, up to 80 percent furloughed or, lay, or, or laid off in some way during during this pause. Um, but yeah, it's been tough. So for partners that have multi-year agreements, we sort of have one straight talking line. We said, it's unprecedented times, you hear that a lot, but we said, we're going to have to look each other in the eye ne- this time next year and know that we got through this as, as fair people. So if we have some companies that we are continuing to order from, you're a cleaning company, you're a whoops, whatever, there's companies that we're still using, we would say, yes, fair, we're still sending you money, you still send us money. But we've got companies that, like, we're not selling beer in our building. We're not selling hot dogs in our building. We're not, you know, if your company is just 100% dependent on our building and we have a multi-year agreement, we've looked at where we can defer payment. Um, and then we've also been fair. You take a Ford, you know, the Ford dealer group, that every single one of their plants in the northern U.S. was shut down. You know, they can't help that they have no cars in the driveway and they're on their lots. We have a multi-year deal with them. So how do we put something in place that allocates us helping their payment and maybe stretching it across next year or um, allocating it in a different way and deferring it? From a new business perspective, I would say we're one of the only teams that are actually using this as an opportunity to continue new business development. And by new business development, I'm not saying being salesy and getting someone on the phone asking for a sales call. 
we're, we're saying this is a perfect get to know you time. Like no pressure whatsoever. Perfect. We've had so many calls every single week. Like I'm not selling you anything. I can't ask you anything right now. I don't even know what to sell you. I just want to get to know you. you know? And so it's a perfect, it's a, that's the spark of the relationship. That's the start, you know. And now we start, we're starting to get all of people in our wheelhouse that as we roll through the excitement of the next 90 days, we can stay in contact with them and still build that relationship. And come September, October, when we're ready to go to sales mode, if you want to call it, we're, we're already down that path and we've started to build that relationship. So from that perspective, obviously, people are saying we're not making any decisions. Our budgets are frozen. We're going kind of saying, awesome, yeah, we're not asking you for money right now. We're just wanting to get to know you. Hey, Katarina, thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious, as someone like you as a FAU communications graduate, how your, um, you know, your studying in that field helped you now in, in translating to, to the business side of things. Any position, you have to uh, say eloquent communication is probably the strong point of any job you'll ever have, or what it is. Um, you know, just so... Every every class I took, every I mean, I remember I took classes that there was no test. There was just a one hour presentation you had to do at the end of the class. And that was great. And like think about how many people are terrified to do that. And you're like, I'm gonna need to do that again in my life. Like what I'm doing right now for you guys. You know, so you know, I even people I know in different classes, like, how long are you speaking for? And are you nervous? And it's just like you, it, it, it helped a lot of that. Even just the, the public speaking part helps you, uh, and, and, you know, in, in that regard. And then I think just having a good framework of the communications um, curriculum has a really strong um, background in, in every, like everything from you should learn about straight journalism, like reporting facts and you know not wordy, fluffy you know facts. You know, learning about how it was portrayed. I took a great class on um, on war and the media, and it went through all of the world wars and how every single different country in media portrayed it differently. Um, so just kind of really, I thought it just gave me a well-rounded, you know, from media to journalism to to marketing to to all of them. They all crisscross, right? Like people think, well, if I go into marketing, I can only get a marketing job, and if I go into broadcast, I can only get a broadcast job, but but they, eventually you use all those skills. I use the wine tasting one too. <laughs> hi, Katarina. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Hi, my name is Alex. Uh, thanks for speaking with us tonight. I've actually known a lot of the people that you're referring to in those PowerPoints. I interned with the Panthers. Uh, for two consecutive seasons about uh, two years ago. So I know like Amanda and Addie and, and all those great people. Awesome. That's awesome. And How did you like your internship? It was great. I did uh, marketing the first season. So I was working with Amanda and Austin Reed and, and Nicole and Jake and all them. And then the second season I did PR. So I was with uh, Chrissy and when Thomas Durant was there and Addie and Mike Lewis. They're all great people. I really I still talk to some of them today actually. Um, yeah, just, the, so Austin just took a job with um, the Colts. He just left yep. us and took a job with the Colts. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I congratulated him. Um, but I, so I, I did my most recent internship with 15 ballpark and sponsorships. And I was just I was curious, how do you, you know, not get frustrated when some of these big deals can take, you know, months to complete? And how do you kind of keep following up with these larger companies? Um, I don't say I always don't get frustrated, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, I, I think if you have if you have enough in, if you have enough prospects that you're talking to, you always have a safety net for someone making a decision to to say no. Um, I, I joke with my staff, most of them are all young and single, and I say don't date monog don't prospect monogamously. Like if you're talking to a window company, don't just talk to one, talk to them for six months, wait till they tell you no, and then talk to another one. Like, talk to 10 at the same time. Pitch them all the same thing. Let them know 
we're talking to 10 other companies. Just so you know, just want to be transparent. And if you have enough, it sounds so basic and simple, but if you have enough at every point in time in the funnel, if someone says, I'm going to pass, you, you have enough, you have enough. I mean, look, there's plenty of those deals that you're like, I like spent so much time and this is so frustrating. But, you know, again, and so much is fine tuning, fine tuning the sales process. And I hate, I hate referring to like sales techniques and closing techniques, but fine tuning that communication process. Like, are you talking to the right person? You know, if you're putting all this time, you can make a beautiful, we could have done that pitch that all this time, we're not putting it in front of the right person, it's all for nothing. So are you talking to the right person? Are you talking to the person who can say yes? Have you really identified what their time frame is? You know, we talked to someone who we had a great call, put together a great pitch, and they said, we love this, but we're not going to be ready until February because that's when our fiscal starts. I was like, oh, how did we not ask that? You know, so, you know, it's, it's when, when we get no's, and it sounds so corny, but trying to figure out where did we misread this? Because sometimes, you know, hope is not a strategy. Sometimes you're just like hoping, like, I hope this closes. I really hope this gets done. But I think if you're asking all questions along the way, um, you're you're kind of getting there together. You know, like, what, are you good potential partner with the, you know, the next step being this, 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 and this? And we'll circle back at this date. Well, if they're like, well, no, it's too soon. Okay. So it just kind of helps us uh, these every now is an opportunity to sort of fine tune the process, and it kind of just help, helps you get better. Yeah. Hi, Katarina. This is Brian. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, so my question would be, if the next hockey season does start later than it usually would, does that mean that that season would be shortened so it finishes when hockey usually would, or does that become like a permanent timetable now for the National Hockey League or um, what are your thoughts on that? I think like, everything circles around TV, right? And and we're gonna be in a weird time the next couple months where every single sport is on. And I think as I think they're gonna try to make absolutely everything finish right before the Summer Olympics. And then sort of reset after that. Because if we can we can bleed a little bit to April May into the Summer Olympics. And that we've had the shortest off season of every sport anyway. So um, if we can, you know, we start in May and maybe it's a, it's a it's executed season as soon as we stop at Summer Olympics and then we start up again normal the following season. Um, that's, I think that's sort of the game plan of sorts is now, again, so much of that been slow right now. I mean, we just found out what host city we were going to a week ago. So. <laughs> I'll ask another question. Uh, what do you want to use for valuation? I know for, for Derby, we do a lot with just the TV exposure, but are there other um, things that you use, like Nielsen or um, other sources to gather ROI information for your partners? So we use Nielsen, and thank for the NHL that we've used that in 100 things forever, but um, we run really lean, um, and we just got Nielsen this season. So, yeah, so. Now, um, if anyone up there doesn't know what I'm referencing, it's basically if 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 I sell a board a dasher board and I charge them, there is, let's say Ford says five hundred thousand dollars, that at the end of the season I can go back to Nielsen and say how much TV visibility did they get, and we actually have documentation that says that was one point two million dollars of TV viewage that they got on on TV during the broadcast game. So when we're doing a recap or going to do a renewal and upselling them, we can say, hey, your 500 grand is going a long way because you're getting, you know, times that in the TV viewership in your local market. So but yeah, we use Nielsen for um, uh, both the digital and the TV side. I know there's some teams, like I guess your Bruins and your Maple Leafs, they've got a different things. 
track social media, digital, I mean, every, everything, absolutely everything. So, um, you know, so, sometimes we're still trying to catch a, you know, an, an Insta story and go snap for, for, for performance, but, uh, but, but it is Nielsen for you. Hi, Katarina. Thanks for doing this. I was wondering, uh, since I've worked with hockey players before, if there was a lot of pushback between uh, the organization and getting them involved since they're usually, like, quiet and, like, very to themselves as far as, like, their off time goes. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a really part of, of the league. You know, you, I think a lot of sports, you sort of have these individual stars I'll do that endorsement or I'll put myself on a pedestal, but hockey is really different. Like they don't, you know, even bark off like, Hey, we want to put you, we want to have you this. And he's like, I don't want to do that. You know, he's just so shy. Um, we, I find, I would say in our organization that the pushback isn't from the guys because they're so protected from our off team that they protect them. So every request has to go through. Team. And, you know, I think if you just, if you're all aligned as an organization of what, what is important to the team, like, hey, can we get some of the players out of dead Broward health to go to the, you know, children's cancer unit? Like, yes, they're going to do it. But, you know, we'll have the people go grand opening of, you know, our hotel in South Beach. Like, we're not going to even ask. They're not going to be that interested in that. So, um it's a little bit of an ebb and flow. We don't get a ton of pushback from them. You know, again, they're, they, they do very cool family guy for the most part um but when it comes to like client events we we just do try to be really aware of what we know is important for them actually just during during all of this is we did something called chats with the cat um we'd have a couple players and one of our ceo of one of our clients sort of answering questions they're just sitting there with their kids, like zooming around behind them, or they're sitting in their living room answering questions. And um, so we, so we did that while everyone was still, you know, really locked down and, and, and did chats with the cats, which generated a, a lot of impressions for for people. I have I have one question. I I used to have uh, well, I still still do have some contacts there. I I have uh, Jerome, I have uh, Amanda, I have Braden. Uh, old, well, Jer Jerome and Braden are graduates. I had Peter Luco, who I'm older than, but I worked with him in Philly. Um, and yeah, um, who do we, uh, if, if some of these folks and some of our other people who aren't in this class are looking to get in, maybe into an internship, I don't know what you guys are doing right now, uh, in corporate sales and in cor corporate partnerships, how would they go about doing that? We do, so standard answer to that would be go to teamworkonline.com. And okay, yep, yep. The thing with teamwork online is what I like. You can really, I used to be such a nerd when I was trying to get into sports or sports or whatever, that I would look at job descriptions and read through them and go, oh, I'd like to do that. Oh, I wouldn't like to do that. Oh, I'd like to do that. To find out, like, my first interview, fun fact, the very first year, BB and Panther, BB and T, I interviewed for an internship with the director of marketing, because I thought I wanted to be in marketing. And um, I, I got it, but it was an unpaid marketing, it was an unpaid internship season. And at the time, I graduated, and I was like, I, I, I want to start making money. And so for like 20 years later, to come back in a job like this is, is kind of funny. But Teamwork Online will give you the jobs across every sport, every state, every role. You'll we'll get everything from the C to an intern and just kind of find out what's required. If you okay. want a job at a certain team, like be way more self, you know? You, you can stalk people on LinkedIn, you know? If I get 100 resumes on Teamwork Online, but I get someone paying me like six times in LinkedIn, like this person is, this person is going to be like relentless and not give up and not take no for an answer, I'll call them back first. Um, so really knowing like who in the organization is, 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 is and again, you can find this all out on, online. If you know you want to be in partnerships, find out who at the Pistons is in partnerships and reach out to them and say, hey, I'd like to be involved. They'll, 
became fairly helpful in connecting you with the with the right person. And then also, if you don't have a contact in the organization, find someone somewhere, and they'll usually send you. Like there's there's a someone answering the phone somewhere who will send you to the HR department in some 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 way to tell you what specifically is available and open. Okay, awesome. Um, we originally had something going with Lane when we were there, and then uh, she was supposed to start getting in touch, and then I guess it, it got a little, uh, I guess, built up too much, so now we just go like through teamwork online, and we all have subscriptions, and we have a specific uh, service that we use for the students that uh, we can get uh, pushed to the front of the line, so to speak. Uh, right. from from teamwork online, yeah. So that that's good. I appreciate Lane that. Is still there, Lane is still there. The one thing I'd say is just like, look, it, sports is competitive. It's like media competitive. Working in the music industry is competitive. Any kind of fun job, if you're not selling copiers. You're not, you know, it, it's it's any kind of job like that's going to be really competitive. And and finding a way. I wish I would have. I wish I should have brought it up. So when I after I did my internship, I actually made a when I had to turn it in for, at FAU to show I did my internship, I made a binder, and I literally taped the binder like a hockey stick. So I did this whole arts and crafts project. I taped the binder, tape, and each each individual section, like here's what I did, here's the media releases I wrote, here's the examples of a day, you know, all that stuff. I, I aligned everything with hockey so that it stood out. After I did my first um, to get my interview, interview, I took my um, resume, and at the time, Beanie Babies were popular, and there was a pink Beanie Baby, and I sent my resume with a pink Beanie Baby to the director of marketing and said, "I just want to meet. Give me an interview." You know, so so much of it just you have to cut, figure out a way to cut through the clutter, something different. I mean, some some of the best I've ever made were the people that emailed me at a website, emailed me at the office, figured out my cell phone number, called me, called me, and I'm like, do you hate me because I'm stalking you? I go, no, I'm calling you back because you're stalking me, and that's exactly what I want. So, you know, figuring out a way to stand out and be different. Look at your network. Like, on LinkedIn, are you connected to someone who's connected to someone, and you say, hey, I see you know that person, and they work in that organization. Could you just connect me with them so that they can give me a way in? And leverage your network too. That is so awesome. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening and with the advice and, and everything and uh, the uh, uh, videos. Uh, I, I did get your um, clip that w wasn't uh, being able to show. I can show that to the students uh, after. Uh, but we want to thank you again. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, we want to have you back next year. Um, uh, when we do the class again, and, um, you know, uh, go Owls. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, or I'll give you guys even all my email. It's just Perez K.